Starting on April the 8th, El Al, not El Al, Air Canada is resuming direct flights from Toronto to Israel. So that's good. But we were not so privileged. We had to go via Boston, pick up El Al in, in Boston. I'm not upset about traveling El Al. Anyways, point of the story is, so we were in Israel and um, Monday, uh, Tuesday was the conference. Wednesday was the conference. But Wednesday night, we got a phone call that my mother-in-law, who was 101, she should be well, um, was very ill. And she was taken uh, by ambulance to the hospital. Uh, honestly, she was near death, to, from what we were told. But through Hashem's kindness, uh, she has, she's bounced back. And she's well enough to come home here at Hashem tomorrow. So it's been quite a ride. I, I miss one third of my conference. Thursday, we spent the, I spent the entire day just trying to figure out how to get us home because we weren't supposed to be coming home till yesterday. But we got home uh, on Friday in time for Shabbos and um, to be with her over Shabbos now at the hospital. So Baruch Hashem, uh, hopefully she'll be coming home tomorrow and uh, she should have the strength. Hashem, everything is in health. Everything's always in Hashem's hands. Even though we're healthy, we need to remember it's all in Hashem's hands. Uh, but when something happens that reminds us of that, it's sort of is a big stark reminder. So what the schut of the shir should be a refuah shlema for her and for everybody who needs a refuah shlema. Um, I know this is not technically part of Parsha Vayakel, which is this Parsha. just want to share one thing with you. So while we're in Israel, I don't know if anybody else listening has had an opportunity to go, but part of the conference was a, a, a trip to the south of Israel to the site of the Nova Festival, where the massacre happened, um, and to the city of Steyrot. So we were in the Nova Festival site, which is overwhelming in its intensity, knowing what happened there. But it wasn't just the site that was overwhelming. We were privileged to listen um, to a mother whose son was taken hostage from the Nova Festival site. And it's, it's almost breathtaking the strength that some of our people have. And listening to this woman who in her fear, anxiety, I don't know what the suffering, is reaching out to other parent mothers and is starting a movement. If anybody wants to help keep Shabbos, she is going to figure out how to make sure that the things necessary for the families to keep Shabbos will happen. So she and one of her friends have started this initiative. And not for people who are from necessarily, for people who are not from, but just listening to their, to their strength and, and, and watching how people have come together and found a way of common language and common purpose uh, and how, to, for some, our religion and the refuge that our religion sometimes gives is extraordinary. Amikam Ka Yisrael, we are such a strong people. Obviously a people with a history of Tremendous challenge, tremendous suffering, loss, pain, um, as we are still in following October the 7th. But it's it's humbling and it's inspiring to realize that somewhere in our personal and national DNA, we have extraordinary abilities. And we need to know that. We have these survival muscles. We have these faith muscles. And from time to time, we perhaps let them lie dormant and something shakes us up. And then when we start using them, it's incredible what it does. So that was just a small bit of that, that very deeply, deeply moving experience that we have. Anyways, that's the background for Parshat Vayakel. And in some ways, it really is a lead in to Parshat Vayakel which begins in Sefer Shemot with Perik Laman A, 35. So as I've said a couple of times over the Shirim in the past, the last five parashot in Sefer Shemot deal to a, to a very large degree with the issues of a Mishka. So Truma Tetzaveh, 100%, certainly part of Kitisa last Shabbat, 
Bayakel this Shabbat and next Shabbat, which is Bikkur Day, the end of Sefer Shmuel. So let's begin Parashat Vayakel on uh, Perak I Just want to read the first pasuk. Vayakel Moshev Kol Adat Bnei Yisrael Vayomer Lehem Ela Hadvarim Asher Tziva Hashem Lasot Otam. So let's just read the translation. Moshe assembled the entire assembly of the children of Israel and said to them, "These are the things that Hashem commanded to do them." Okay. So on the surface. It's an informative pursuit, clearly. But as you know, using the traditional rabbinic lens of explaining the psukim, this pursuit has a lot more depth to it than just information that's being imparted to the reader. So let's take a look at it one more time, especially the first part. So clearly, there is a huge section that is going to be said, recorded, taught to the Jewish people. But the entire Torah, certainly from the time they left Mitzrayim, is a series of interactions where Moshe teaches the Torah to the Jewish people. And so you would assume that when Moshe teaches the Torah to the Jewish people, he's assembling them. But no other place does it say Vayakel Moshe. Meaning, normally, when, Mo when the Torah describes I'm going to use this word a conversation or an interaction between Moshe and the Jewish people. You probably know that the general introductory psukim are Vayomer Shem Moshe Limor Daber B'nai Yisrael or Vayomer Moshe B'nai Yisrael Vayomer Moshe B'nai Yisrael but it never says he gathered them. Well, we figured that he gathered them because how else are you going to teach it? This, there's, it's not a digital age. It's not microphones. So if you're going to teach, you have to gather them and in so doing, you provide the environment that you're going to teach. But here it's explicit. And it's in the explicit introduction that I wonder, why is it explicit? Because all other places, it's implied. And we're good with that. We're cool with that. We understand the implication. But here it's Vayakel Moshe. He gathered them. But it's just more than just Vayakel Moshe. It's Vayakel Moshe et Kol Adat Bnei Yisrael. So we've got to stop there for a minute. What does that mean, call it that B'nai Israel? Literally, it means and the entire assembly or congregation of the children of Israel. So that also is different because usually it's Vayomer Hashem El B'nai Israel, But here it's Kol Adat B'nai Israel. Now this is one of a few times that this phrase El Kol Adat B'nai Israel appears. One of the other times it appears, it's not on Sefer Shemot, I think we may have talked about this at uh, Ashir last year in Parshat Kedoshim, which is uh, in Sefer Vayikra, as you know. So here, it, well, I'll read the beginning of Parshat Kedoshim. So that's Perib Yutet Sefer Vayikra. By the Ber Hashem al Moshe Limor. So that starts the way we normally expect it. By the Ber Hashem al Moshe Limor, Hashem said to Moshe, Hashem spoke to Moshe, saying, now you repeat this to the Jewish people, Daber el kol adat ben Israel. Speak to the entire assembly congregation of the children of Israel. On that pasuk in Sefer Vayikra, er, Parshat Kedoshim, Rashi pauses for a moment and says, you know, this is an unusual formulation. It's interesting that Rashi doesn't make this comment in Parshat Vayakil, but he does make it in Parshat Kedoshim, which is in the next Kumash. What's the unusual formulation? So Rashi immediately tells us the usual formulation is that it's never usually the entire assembly of the Israel. So there, the Chachamim paused to tell us, very misfortunately, that there was a deliberate instruction that Hashem gave to Moshe in Parashat Kedoshim. What was the deliberate instruction? That the content of Parashat Kedoshim had to be imparted and taught while everybody was standing together. And where does it say everyone stands together? El Kol Adat B'nai Yisrael. How else could it be said? And there, Rashi tells us, well, it could be El B'nai Israel. The addition of Kol Adat B'nai Israel emphasizes it's the entire people together. What do I mean the entire people? Everybody. Men, women, and children all together. So that phrase appears in Sefer Shemot Parashat Vayakel. Vayakel Moshe. So here, Vayakel and Kol Adat B'nai Israel. So... Kol Adat B'nei Yisrael itself implies the collection of the congregation. 
and Vayakel, apparently them, adds yet another dimension. The word Vayakel, for those of you who are familiar with the Hebrew language, Kuf He Lamed is the Shorish. And that forms the root of a couple of words that we all know, Kihila. What's a Kihila? It's a community. Most shuls are called in Hebrew, Kihila Kidusha, the holy congregation of whatever it is, Kihila, Share Shamayim, Kihila. In actually, um, in the prayer that we recite at Shemaim every week for the release of the hostages, at Kol HaKahal HaKadosh Hazeh. So that you have. So now let's go back again and try to understand using only one uh, commentary. What's the message here? The unusual language is the portal to understand something deeper than just the information. Years ago in, in Toronto, at the University of Toronto, there was a professor. His name was Marshall McLuhan. I don't know if anybody remembers the name Marshall McLuhan. He was a professor who was into media. And one of the phrases he made popular, I don't know how popular it is today, but I certainly remember it earlier on, was the medium is the message. Which means not only is content itself the, what needs to be learned, understood, assimilated, but the way in which content is tr transmitted itself bears a message. And so I think that ultimately also becomes the idea of someone being a lot smarter than Marshall McLuhan, the Bill Nadal, who in his commentary to the Torah makes a fascinating explanation. And just to give the background to what the Bill Nadal is saying, just to remind you that this is not the first Parsha where Sam introduces the responsibility obligation to build the Mikdash. That happened in Parsha Truma Tetzavah. So way back in Parsha Truma Tetzava, when Hashem said, okay, I want you to build a base, of, I build a Mishkan, later to become the Beit Mikdash, there Hashem says, Vasuli Mikdash, make for me a sanctuary. Vishachanti, remember how to conclude the verse, Vishachanti Bitochan, and I shall dwell in them. From a grammatical point of view, that doesn't really sound like it's the correct use of the word. It should be Bitochon. Build me a sanctuary. So in our minds, of course, whatever that sanctuary looks like, it's a physical structure. It's a place. It's got walls. It's got dimensions. So build this structure in my name, in my honor, for me, Basuk indicates, and I shall dwell, and I expect the conclusion of the verse to be, the shachanti in Hebrew, betocho, and I shall dwell in it, this structure, such as it is. But that's not the word. The word is betocham, and I shall dwell in them. Well, Hashem only wants one structure. So what could the word be them referring to? And there we see that, we have, of course, you understand that the them refers to the Jewish people, the people themselves. So Hashem is saying, build me a structure and I will dwell in the people, in their hearts, in their consciousness. So listen to the way the Vilna Gaon then tries to use that is a background to explain the linguistic, the language, the use of phraseology in the beginning of Parshat Vayakel, which is again Vayakel Moshe to create this community of the entire congregation of Bnei Israel. And the Bill Nagon says he wants to know what's going to make the Mishkan the place that Hashem wants to dwell within the Jewish people. In other words, what does the Mishkan do that brings God's presence? Basuli Mikdash, so build a Mishkan, and I want to dwell in them. But why? Like, what is it about the Mishkan that draws God's presence downward? Even if, it, even if the, the presence is within us, which apparently is an indicated in the verse, what is it about the Mishkan? So the Vilna Gon makes an interesting idea, and he says, it's not the Mishkan. It's not the Mishkan which draws God's presence. So it's not like you built up this beautiful Aaron and gold crew beam and you got all the proper material and you built the right dimensions and you followed my instructions and it looks like I wanted to and it's got the ritual. No, no. The Holy One says that's not what ultimately brings Hashem's presence. So what brings Hashem's pre brings Hashem's presence says the Vilna Gaon, is the fact that the people are united around 
this holy task, this holy endeavor of building the Mishkan. That's what brings God's presence to dwell among them. So it's not the existence of the Mishkan per se, but it's the fact that it serves as a focal point around which the Jewish people create their camp, which in fact is correct, not in our parsha, but later on in Torah, as Hashem describes how the camp in the desert is supposed to be set up. So the Mishkan's in the build is in the middle. So the Mishkan's in the middle and everyone else is all around it. So the Mishkan creates a sense of unity. Vayakel Moshe, Moshe creates the community by bringing them all together and saying, hey guys, this is for us. It's a communal endeavor. So it's not just the holiness of the functionality of the ritualistic observances of the Mishkan, which forms the holiness or informs the holiness. It's the fact that you and I form a community that makes the Mishkan holy. And it's a fascinating idea because it's really one for the ages. And sometimes we forget that. And now we understand a little bit about why and how this whole process was directed by God. So what was the process? The process was, okay, now go collect everything from everybody. And everybody contributes. And not everybody is going to be necessarily involved in all the artisanship and craftsmanship. But everybody is going to feel that they had a role to play in the construction. That's community. Everybody participating and nobody was technically left out because everybody gave to the extent that they could or wanted to what they could or what they wanted to and according to the torah um, this was an extraordinary event probably the only event in history or when there was a fundraiser everybody contributed to the point where they contributed so much that moshe had to call a halt to the campaign okay everybody we have everything that we need that will never, of course, be recreated at any point in Jewish history. There's no organization, no institution, no day of giving is going to end with, we have enough, thank you very much. But that's what happened here. So now we can perhaps understand why the Pasuk emphasizes Moshe assembling the entire people. Because the topic he was presenting them, which was the topic of the construction of the Mishkan, would only be capable, we could only do it, and we could only bring Hashem's presence down if everybody was united around it. Um, October 7th also united the people. And sometimes we, we let slip the opportunities to unite us that are positive and holy, active, and we unfortunately sometimes wait for the tragedies to befall us and then we get united so i think our goal following october the 7th is to maintain the unity but not because we're all crying together in sadness but because we're all united together with a purpose to build something to build something worthwhile we don't always agree on what's worthwhile. And that may be a challenge for the Jewish people. But that's how we're beginning Parshat Vayakhel and why the Torah emphasizes the idea of community. Staying within Parash at Paraglamet I want to move to Pasuk Chaf 20. And I'm just going to, you don't have to use your Pumash, as you know, I'm going to read Pasuk Chaf. So Moshe has gathered them all. He's taught them, he said to them what he needs to say. The very first part that he says to them is about Shabbos. And then after he talks about Shabbos, he continues with the discussion more about the Mishkan. The, the insertion of the topic of Shabbos is also itself a subject of a lot of debate. What's Shabbos doing amongst all the verses dealing with the Mishkan? And of course, you understand that the insertion of the laws of Shabbos is to make sure that the people realize that even though it may seem that the building of the Mishkan is itself a priority, God himself wants it, not only because he wants it, he's going to dwell amongst the people once it's done properly, but even so, Shabbos takes precedence. So you're going to work for six days, but when it comes to Shabbos, all work, even Mishkan work, comes to a complete halt. And in fact, as hopefully most of us know, 
when it comes to the proper observance of Shabbos now, how do we know which activities are permissible and which activities are not permitted on Shabbat? Well, the activities that were necessary for the building of the Mishkan, the 39 categories of Melacha, are themselves the Melachot that you and I today observe in the proper observance of Shabbos. In other words, the point I'm making is, is that the building of the Mishkan and the observance of Shabbos go hand in hand. So if you're talking about, so lighting a fire on Shabbos, like what does that have to do? Because they needed to light a fire in order to do various activities in the Mishkan, to, to make parts of the Mishkan and to function properly. So, or why can't you and I weave? If, you know, we, we like to knit. If some of you have this passion to knit and do stuff, not on Shabbos, why not? Because the idea of weaving was part of the activities or necessary to create the Mishkan. So Gemara Masech of Shabbos tells us, that all of the activities necessary for the construction of the Mishkan are the very same activities that you and I today must be mindful of in, in, if we want to observe Shabbos properly. So we're jumping out to the Sukkah. So after this initial sort of assembly, Moshe teaches what he needs to teach. Torah tells us, Vayetzu kol adat b'nei Yisrael nifnei Moshe. The entire assembly of the children of Israel left Moshe's presence. So let's stop again and apply the very same sort of precise reading of the section at the end as we did in the beginning. So in the very beginning, we asked what question? Why does the Torah have to tell us that Moshe assembled the people? He had to assemble the people when he spoke to them because how else is he going to teach it? Now, one of the questions that we didn't delve dwell on this time that we dwelt in the past is, well, Moshe's traditional method of teaching the Torah to the Jewish people was assembling them, but not assembling everybody all at once. What he did was he assembled them in groups, and he taught the Torah multiple times, because that's a more effective way of teaching Torah, as it would be in a classroom. We don't take a whole school, have the entire school stand outside in the yard, and then have one person teach the entire school on topic. That's not effective. You divide them into smaller groups, have teachers teaching each group. That makes more sense pedagogically. So the same thing with the Jews in the desert. It made a lot more sense for Moshe to teach people in groups, which is, in fact, the way in which he did it, except for Parshat Kedoshim, which I read to you earlier, where Shem says, no, I don't want you to separate. I want men, women, and children all standing together. I want you to teach the content of that chapter while everybody's standing together. We may have to repeat it another time, but in its initial presentation, I want everybody together. And apparently, that's the very same message in this section. So now everybody's standing together. So even though you and I would have normally assumed that Moshe gathered the people in order to teach them, and it was not necessary to say, Vayakel, he gathered them, he always gathered them up, but in this case, it was different. He created the sense of community that may not have otherwise existed for other portions of the Torah. Great, okay, so now I get the beginning. Now listen to the conclusion of this interaction. One more time. Vayetsu kol adat b'nei Yisrael mitnei Moshe. And the entire assembly of the children of Israel left Moshe's presence. Let's say this pasuk was never written. What would you and I think as intelligent readers of the verse? Well, we'd assume that at the conclusion of whatever Moshe was teaching, everybody went home. Do, I, do, do we really have to be told that once Moshe finished teaching it, people went home? What? We really thought that from the time that this verse began, they're all standing there day and night, 24-7? Of course not. They're going home. And yet, even though that would have been a normal assumption for an intelligent reader, as you are, as I am, the Torah wants us to know, no, so everybody left. So once the Torah makes it clear that he gathered them and then everybody left, not only is the gathering a point of contention or a point of interest, so is the leaving. And so it's not surprising that the Torah's insistence that you and I know, that they left the presence of Moshe, that too should be something that we should stop and think about. So let's stop and think about it, and I'm going to share an interesting insight with you. So what is the deeper lesson? So let's just stop for a second and just think together what Moshe represents to the Jewish people. So what better Parsha to understand the role that Moshe played than last week's Parsha, Kitisa, especially Paraklam and Beit, the story of the golden calf. So we understand the story of the golden calf, why God got upset. We understand that the Jews miscalculated. They didn't quite understand. They weren't paying close enough attention when Moshe says, I'm coming down. They started counting the days, and Moshe said, I'll be back, but they got mixed up, and they 
he didn't come down when they calculated he, they should come down. And then the whole story of the eagle as a half the golden cow followed. Right. So Moshe, however, is at the center of the story in what sense? That they relied on him so deeply that his absence scared them. And yes, while they may have reacted inappropriately, the story still is a story about the central role that Moshe Rabbeinu played in the lives of the Jewish people. That he was their rock in the sense of stability, of confidence, of knowing that somebody's leading them. There's somebody there who's going to answer a question. Somebody there who knows enough. He's, who, he's, he's going to be, we're going to be taken care of because Moshe is here. And you probably know that as well. We have confidence in our leaders. And when our leaders are not there, not that we're unable to do our regular activities, but there's something unsettling about the absence of a leader. So having said that, having understood the central role that Moshe played in the dynamic of the people, we go back to this verse and say, the people left Moshe's presence. And that's an interesting comment, especially in light of last week's Parsha, where his absence scared them and they were unsettled and they weren't sure what to do. Now the Torah wants us to know, and they left Moshe's presence. It's almost as though the Torah is telling us that something happened and we're as Last week, in last week's Parsha, the narrative told us about the dependency of the people on Moshe. This Pasuk is telling us there has, in fact, been a shift. So with last week's backdrop, and in this week's Pasuk, Parsha Vayakel is trying to tell us that B'nai Israel were more empowered to act and accomplish things on their own not necessarily in Moshe's presence. The Torah emphasizes that despite Moshe being at the height of his leadership, here he is, he's leading the people, he's advocating, he's prepared even to die for the Jewish people. The Torah is describing the people now as taking a step forward in their own maturation process. The entire community left Moshe's presence. So they donated the materials and they constructed the Mishkan as he requested, as he taught. Um, but in some ways, without him being at the core of it, he was at the core of it, of course, and being the supervisor, being the prophet, he still was present. But the Torah is using language, they left his physical presence. Um, it's almost like a little kid. You know, there's a period where a child can't be without his mother or father. And then they get a little bit more bold and they don't have to see mom anymore. And then they can experiment and get 20 feet away. They may keep looking back. And then, of course, the time comes where they don't have to be there at all. And they can be tough and independent. Doesn't mean they're not thinking about their mother or father. They're aware of their existence, but they don't have to be in direct presence of them. So he pushed them. Moshe Rabbeinu pushed them to act even when he was not present. He instilled within the congregation um, this confidence, especially after the golden calf. And that could have been a, a confidence-destroying event. It's possible that they would have been so crestfallen. It's possible that they would have been so distraught after what happened that they couldn't sort of claw their way back, but they did and this pursuit tells us a little bit about that. So Moshe rescued them in last week's Parsha, but he also gave them the strength to build themselves back. And this pursuit, although it seems to be just another information, may in fact be opening up a curtain to understanding a lot about how people need to grow. And that sometimes... We need a push, all of us need a push to go beyond our comfort zone and to try to do things that go beyond our safety net a little bit. And I don't mean doing things which are inappropriate, plus for show, but taking a step and feeling emboldened and feeling that we can, because sometimes we're scared and sometimes we have to, we feel we have to rely on others. I can't do it. It's not me. But this soup says it could be you. It could be. We do need the encouragement, but it could be you. So that's that idea. That's why this verse so wonderfully closes the whole beginning part of Vayakel 
gathering, being in his presence, and then Vayetsu Melifnei Moshe. And that's what we all want. We want, as parents, to be able to watch our children or as teachers. In some ways, of course, all of us are teachers because we give messages to all the people around us. We need confidence. We need to be told we can do it. I'm going to stay, stay within Parsha of Ayakot, chapter 35, and I'm going to skip now to Pasuk Chavzayim. <clears throat> Chavzayim. So in turning to the people and asking everybody to donate, it's where it tells us that everybody donated. And here I'm going to read Pasuk Chavzayim to you. The leaders, the Nassim, the English translation of the Nassim is leaders, but the leaders being referred to here are the leaders of each of the Shvatim, of the tribes. The Nassim here are the leaders brought the Shoham stones and the stones for the settings for the ephod and the breastplate. So, among the various things that need, need to be uh, created, to be built, constructed, were um, the breast, the ephod and the breastplate, which the Kohen Gadol would be wearing. This is part of the Kohen, the high priest's garments. And one of the things that were to be inserted on these garments were gemstones. And on the gemstones would be carved the names of the Shvatim. So where do these gemstones come from? So that's where it tells us, well, these were the donations that were made by the Nisi'im. Now, one of the things that uh, you can't see, in, uh, unless you're looking for much, you may not know, the Hebrew word for leaders or princes is Nisi, singular Nisi'im, plural. And in the proper spelling of the word Nisi'im, plural, it's Nun, Sin, Yud, Aleph, that's Nasi, singular, and to make it plural, we add a yod and a mem. Nisi'in. Nasi. Singular nisi'in. If you take a look at Pumash, it's spelled this way. Nun, sin, ayin, mem. Uh, aleph, mem, excuse me. So we got yod missing here. The, the, the word is not spelled out in its fullness. So that's a little unusual, too. God does not make spelling mistakes. I make spelling. Kids make spelling. Not a sham. This is not a, an imperfect safer. Oh, you know what? I didn't have time to review it, and uh, there's a mistake. Caught it. No. So let's go and understand a little bit of what's going on here. So Rashi tells us, um, offers a midrash, as to what's the background story about the contributions, and specifically the princes, the Nisi'in, the leaders' contributions of these shoham stones, these uh, gemstones that were used for part of the Kohen Gadol's clothing. So Rashi tells us that the Nisi'im actually, unfortunately, underestimated what B'nai Israel were willing to do and how much they would be willing to donate in this project of collecting everything for the construction of the Mishkan. And they assumed, the Nisi'im, that the people's donations would hardly be sufficient to build everything that Hashem wanted to build in the Mishkan. So they had this idea in their minds that they're going to be the sort of the fail-safe for the Jewish people. We're going to let everybody give whatever they want. And at the end of the day, since there's going to be such a shortfall, we're going to step up and we're going to make up the shortfall. Nisi'im, obviously, were people of resources and means, and they felt that it would be an honor for them to contribute to the Mishka. That's true. It would have been. But the way in which they wanted to contribute was to wait till everybody else finishes, and then the anticipated shortfall will be covered by them. However, how did it all play out? It didn't play out the way the Nassim figured it. In the end, everything, everything was donated, and all that was left for the Nassim to donate were the stones. Because everything else, and there was a lot of everything else, was actually covered by the by in its entirety by the people. Um, so therefore, Rashi adds the Nisim were criticized. They were criticized for delaying their contribution. So when Rashi says that they were criticized, it's interesting. He says the following. 
just um, oops, sorry. Rashi says hit atslu, which means from the word atsail. Anybody know what the word atsail means? It's a little lazy. So the Nisi'im sort of had a lazy attitude towards the contributions to the Mishkan. And so he accuses them, or the Midrash that Rashi quotes, of a little bit of laxity in their attitude. So why is it lax? Why is giving to the Mishkan, the, the, the um, Agnei Shoham, why do the Chachamim and Rashi think that that was a sign of laxity. They contribute. Um, but calling them atslanim, like mit atslu, that's, that's a harsh word. So wherein lies the basis for that harsh criticism? So Rabbi Sim, uh, Simcha Ziskin Broidy, who was one of the Musa teachers in Europe before the war, a lot before the war, wrote a parish on Chumash called Sam Derech. And he offers an interesting explanation. Um, and this is what he says. He says, okay, it's true that when you take a look at what happened, you could say that the Nisim miscalculated. It's, they did. They miscalculated. What was their miscalculation? Their miscalculation was that the people wouldn't give enough and that they would be well prepared. And that's a good idea. It's, it's an honorable intention. I'll be the one. So whatever shortfall is, come to me. I'm happy to write the check. We're having a campaign, a renovation campaign of a shul, whatever it is, the school. And I say, I'm your guy. Whatever is not filled, uh, filled in by general donation, I will cover the check. So that's a good intention. There's nothing bad about that. But if the campaign was wildly successful, my donation becomes smaller. So I could have made a bigger donation at the beginning, but because everybody else stepped up, technically what's left is going to be smaller. So Rav Simcha Ziskin Broidy makes the following suggestion. So people often figure out or have their own rationale for why they don't do something. We do. And we make our decisions. I'm going to do this. I'm not going to do that. And here's the reason that I'm not doing it. And truthfully, the rationale that we come up with um, may seem okay. But really, for many of us, and I'm not accusing anybody, but sometimes those rationales are really excuses in disguise. And re perhaps Rashi is making the following comment about the Nisi'im as well. Because maybe that's what motivated them. That to sit back and wait for everybody else, that's not leadership. You know, one of the things that always characterizes the officers and leaders in Sahal is the fact that this was the so Aharai. What does Aharai mean? Follow me. I'm your leader. I'm your captain. I'm your. I'm leading the Gadud. I'm in charge of the battalion. That's us. Acharai, you follow me. And obviously, that's one of the reasons that we have a very, fortunately, we have a high rate of injury or loss amongst the officers in Saho because they're not sitting back and waiting in some sort of situation room like Wolf Blitzer and trying to figure out, you know, what should be done. They're getting out in the field. They're leading people. So if you're a leader. That's what you should be doing. You should be leading. And to come up with a idea, okay, no, my, I'm just going to be the cleanup guy after no, that they, they fall short. For well, one, it's not a nice thing to think that everybody's going to fall short. How do you know that? And two, that's not a leader. A leader doesn't wait. A leader jumps forward. A leader is the person that pushes forward so everybody can see the model. And that's not what they did. And so Rashi is suggesting perhaps that that's a form of leadership laxity. That's absolute. That's where you're sitting back. You're not leading. It's can, an, I, can I make an observation? And let me just. That may be an attempt. Right. It may right. be an attempt at some sort of um, justification. 
Now, that theory explains something that is a textual oddity in the Pasuk, which is what? How do you spell the word Nasi? Nun, Sin, Yud, Aleph. The Yud is missing. And why is the Yud missing? It's not an accident. It's not an error. The Torah dropped the word Yud. Hashem dropped the letter, not the word. Drop the letter Yud. Why? As a criticism, as a way of demonstrating that they were deficient. Something was missing in their attitude. And the way in which the Torah describes that deficiency, that laxity, that atzlut, according to this explanation, is by deliberately leaving out the letter Yud. So the message at the end of all of this is we often have to be honest with our own motives and we have to take a step back. And some, And I'm not saying that all motives are suspect, but we just have to make sure that we're really we're being genuine to ourselves, genuine to Hashem, that the reason I'm not doing something is the right reason. Because we are all clever and we are so clever that very often we, are, we can talk ourselves into why our decision is right. And it's not always right. A lot of other motives um, can uh, move us in a certain direction. So that's that important. I, 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 I didn't mood everybody, but somebody wanted to say something yeah. now. Maybe we can wait till we finish. What? I, it's, it's Nigel. I, I'm sorry I came in a bit late and I wasn't sure what the rules were. Nigel, be. I'm going to ask you if you just want to hold your comment, write it down. Yep. So at the end, okay. I'll wait, we'll go back. Is that okay? Fine. There's no chat. There's, there's no raise hand thing on, on the bottom. So. No, no, because I'm just, I generally right. just go through the share. Okay. And we, we schmooze it out. Then happy to um, at the end. Okay? Perfect. Okay. Um, all right. We're going we're gonna, to. One of the um, it's the remaining, again, in Parag Lamed, hey, I'm going to skip to Pasuk Lamed. Pasuk Lamed introduces us to another personality that's involved in the construction of the Mishkan. So we certainly know about Moshe. Uh, we know about Aharon and his children and their function in it. But in the actual creation and uh, craftsmanship in the building, Here's where the Torah introduces this person. Moshe, excuse me, speaks to the Jewish people and he says this. Ru'u, kara Hashem b'shem b'tzalel ben Uri ben Chor lemate Yehuda. I'll read it in English. Moshe said to B'nai Israel, see, Hashem has proclaimed by name b'tzalel, son of Uri, son of Chor, of the Sheva, the tribe of Yehuda. And Hashem filled him with godly spirit, with wisdom, insight, and knowledge, and with every craft. I'm going to read a little bit more. V'lachshov machashavot la'asot v'azahav uv'kasef uv'kasef uv'nefoshet to weave designs, to work with gold, silver, and copper. Uvacharoshet evin lemalot, uvacharoshet aids, lasot behold, nelechet machashavet. He gave him the ability to teach him. No, I'm sorry, I skipped the pasuk. Um, to weave designs, to work with gold, silver, and copper, stone cutting, mm -hmm. setting, and wood carving to perform every craft of design. So let's go back. We're introduced to somebody whose name is Bitzalel, Ben Uri, Ben Chur, Lemate Yehuda. Okay, so again, with the exacting reading of the rabbinic uh, lens, we look at this introduction of a new character, a new person in, in the narrative, and we notice that the way in which the Torah teaches us or introduces this person is a little bit different. It's a little bit different. What's different about it? Well, what's different about it is his family lineage. What's different about it? His father and his grandfather. Wow. That's what's different about it. The Torah usually tells us about who a person is, it's the person and his father's name. 
usually doesn't go back to the grandfather. But here it's Bitzalel ben Hori, ben Hur. Oh. Of course, we need to know that he is his Shevet of origin is Yehuda. So let's just follow the thinking of one of the commentaries in the 1800s called the Meshech Bochma, the strong mayor of Dvinsk. And um, in his explanation, Torah genius, um, he wrote short explanations, very terse. Some, some, sometimes he wrote things much, a little bit longer. But in his explanation of this, he offers some, some interesting insights that I, I just want to share with everybody tonight. So the Torah describes this man as a person who is blessed with Chochma, Tzvuna, and Da'at. He has this Chochma, Tzvuna, and Da'at. He has wisdom, insight, and knowledge. He has this understanding, assets, which obviously are important and valuable to do the task that he's been assigned. So where did he get this from? Like, is it just a coincidence? Like, this guy just happened to have this? Okay, everybody line up. Let's have a little bit of an art display. Show us the stuff we've done in the past. And from this little exhibition, we will, you know, tender a design or figure out whether you're capable enough to be the craftsman leading the team in the construction of the Mishkan. But the Torah wants us to know who he, what his family tree is and that he has these skills. So, again, when, when Torah gives us details like it has here, it's usually a sign for us to pause to think, what, what do we need to know that's beyond just the surface information here? So let's take a look and see if we can, and the, uh, through the eyes of the Mesha Chochma, pull back a curtain to understand who is being introduced to us. So he's, first of all, one of the things that, at the end of the verse, he's from Shevet Yehuda. Does that matter? Is that, like, what, what do we know about Shevet Yehuda? Well, it is one of the Shvatim, clearly. It's a Shvatim of leaders. When Yaakov died, before he died in Parshat by Ephraim, he blessed all of his kids. He made it very clear that Shevet Yehuda was to uh, occupy a really special spot amongst the other Shvatim. What's that spot? That spot is, it's going to be the Shevet from which all legitimate kings come from. That means the Davidic dynasty will originate from Shevet Yehuda. Okay, that's fine. But what else do we know, especially in the story of Yitziat Mitzrayim? So, the Midrash tells us about the role of Shevet Yehuda in Yitziat Mitzrayim, and the scene that everybody knows, this part of the story, is Kriyat Yamsu. So, there's a sea in front of them, the Reed Sea. The Egyptians are chasing, and God creates a sort of blockage. He brings the pillar of fire that makes it impossible for the Egyptians to advance. But the Jews are still caught at the, at the shore of the, of the waters, and they see no escape. The Egyptians are behind them. The sea is in front of them. So Hashem tells Moshe, okay, raise your hand, tell the people to go. And apparently... The way in which our, our rabbis understood the scene, at least midrashically, contrary to the way it may be portrayed in the movies, you, know, you see Moshe standing at the top and all the water splits and then everybody goes. According to the midrash, that's not the way it happened. Yes, the water split. Yes, the Moshe is standing on top, 100%. Was he holding the stick? Not holding the stick, which, by the way, is the cloak. But according to one midrash, it didn't split until, until what? Until somebody went into the water. Oh. Until somebody had enough yeah. faith in Hashem to say, if you're telling me to go forward, Hashem, and you've got my back, I trust you. I don't know how this is going to work out, but if you tell me to go, I'm going to go. Nobody wanted to go. Nobody wanted to go. They were all afraid. Until somebody jumped into the water, went deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper, and the Vidrash says, until the water reached his nose, which means he couldn't go any deeper without drowning. And then the water began to split. It was at that point that the water split. And who was that person? Nachshon ben Aminadab. And what Shevet did Nachshon ben Aminadab come from? It came from Shevet Yehuda. So that's an important fact. Because just keep in mind that that moment in time of the splitting of the Red Sea, the Reed Sea, 
did not happen so far earlier than this particular story of Vayakhel. Remember? The golden calf story happened when Moshe went up on Har Sinai, which was 50 days. So Moshe went up 50 days, uh, excuse me, 50 days after Har Sinai, he goes up. No, 50 days after Yitziat Mitzrayim, he goes up. 40 days on the mountain, he comes down, and that's where we have the whole debacle of the golden calf. But that's still not so long. Everybody remembered Kriget Yamsu. Ah. Even, of course, mm -hmm. Salel, Ben Uri, Ben Chor, mm -hmm. uh, Shevet Yehuda. So he knew that. He comes from the Shevet of, of the leaders who are prepared to follow into Yamsu. Mm -hmm. That's number one. But here's the other part mm -hmm. of the story that you need to know. And this part mm -hmm. happened after Kriyat Yamsu. His mm -hmm. father's name is Uri. And his grandfather's name is Hor. So here again, we have our Torah Sheba al that fills in a little bit about who Hor was. So what made Hor famous? Hor became famous during the story of the Eagle Hazahab, which transpires or is described in Masu's Barsha. What happened? So when the people became scared and they wanted to replace Moshe, whether it was idolatry or not idolatry, is not part of the conversation tonight. Mm -hmm. But when they were pressuring, we want to create mm -hmm. some sort of representation, mm -hmm. Hor stepped forward and said, no way, this is not consistent with what God wants. And mm -hmm. he was pushing back against those who wanted it. Mm -hmm. And according to the Midrash, he was murdered. Mm -hmm. He was murdered. So Bitzalel's grandfather was murdered by the hands of the people who wanted to build the Eagle Hazaha. And so now I have a little bit of an understanding of Bitsalo's own personal family history. His grandfather was murdered because of the Eagle Hazaha, and he comes from the Shevet of Nachshon ben Aminadav, who are the first person to jump into the Yamsuf in order to make sure that it split. Now, why do we want to know that about this man called uh, but so well, why is his selection to be the chief architect, the craftsman for the construction of the Mishkan, why is that important? So the Mesha Chochma says those two incidents of Nachshon ben Aminadav jumping into the sea and Chur are examples of what? And here's the Mesha Chochma says, well, it's Mesira Nefesh. So dedicated, so dedicated of what? They were so dedicated that they overcame what could clearly have been rational explanations that they should do other, follow another route. Jumping into the river, into the sea, when it's not split, and keep going deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. That's not logical. You have no logical reason to assume that you're going to come out of this. But he did it anyways. He did it anyways because he had a serious nephew. He had it, did it anyways because he was committed to following God's word. Not because it was logical, not because it made sense, not because it was reasonable, but because he believed in Hashem. And because he believed in Hashem, he says, I'm going. I do not believe God is going to let me die. And so he meant that. And Hor, what was Hor doing? What was he thinking? He's one person. Even though the Torah tells us, of course, that Hashem told Moshe to get to fight back and to kill all the people who were involved in the building of the Eagle of the Zahab. So as we know, the Levine were the ones who put on their, their, their swords that they fought, and 3,000 people died that day. Okay, so it may not be hundreds of thousands, but 3,000 people is a big crowd. 3,000 people is a big crowd. Sir Hur was standing up as one guy against 3,000, and he was prepared to do that? That's not logical. You, you wait for the troops to come. You call in the, the support. But he said, no, I'm not doing that. I'm not waiting. I'm making a stand here. And he did die. Unlike Nachshan, who didn't die, Hur did. And it's his grandfather. And if anybody should say, not me, I'm, hey, I'm out of here. I don't want to get involved anymore. I watched my grandfather get murdered in order to defend his belief in God. I don't want to do this. That's not his response. Hashem says, no, this guy, Bitzalel, came out of this with a different attitude. There's anybody who's able to take charge and build a Mishkan with the right motives, it's going to be Bitzalel. Because he comes from a family, he comes from a shade that understands what leadership means. He comes from a family that's able to sort of 
suspend what otherwise may be logic in order to be guided by a different by a different uh, motivator, by Mesirut Nefesh. And therefore, Hashem says, I want to make very clear why I'm picking him and not somebody else. Because who he is and what his family line is. So it's this background to Bezalel's extraordinary wisdom. That's where we got it from. It derives from Hashem's willingness to deal in a, in a, um, a method called Midah, Keneged Midah, which literally means measure for measure. What's the measure for measure according to the Meshachofa? The measure for measure is that the Shevet Yehuda generally and poor specifically were prepared to suspend the faculty of Da'at in order to offer their lives for Kiddush Hashem. They had to suspend that. Their logic, their intelligence should have said, this is not a smart move. This is not the way to go. Don't jump into the water. You don't have a life jacket. You're not going to make it. Don't stand up against 3,000 people. Sometimes you come out of one way and sometimes we don't. Like, there's no way of explaining why all these young men in Israel are anxious, anxious to get involved in the war. Like, no, I got to protect myself. I'm not getting involved. It's not happening. It's just the opposite. So many of these chayalim, and they are wearing kippot, are going into Gaza, are going into the most treacherous places. And they say, I want to do this. I'm going to go. It doesn't make sense. But that's the Mesiru Nefesh. That's the Mesiru Nefesh of the Yehudim. Remember that, of course, as Jews, we're called Yehudim. And that word Yehudim comes from Yehuda. And so we are, in some ways, all the people of Nachshon ben Aminadav, and maybe even Hur, that we stand up to things, even if it looks like we don't know how it's going to end. Hur had the courage to stand up against those who represented antithetical positions to Torah, and he yeah. gave up his life. But in so giving up his life, it was his his grandson who became the chief architect of holiness for the Jewish people. So, a couple thoughts about that. One, we have no idea what we do today may in fact be the inspiration for our grandchildren. And I'm not suggesting that they're going to have to fight in a war. But I am suggesting that we could be a source of inspiration for them in other ways, just like Nachshon was a source of inspiration and Hor was a source of inspiration. Maybe we can be sources of inspiration too. Maybe we have to be sources of inspiration. If any time in history, this is one of those times where what we do today, the decisions we make, the calls that we, that, that, that we answer, maybe what our grandchildren, great-grandchildren are going to talk about you know, I remember what Booby did or Zadie did or my aunt or my uncle. I remember going to shul and I saw people there. Or I remember reading a book about that could be us. And then the other thing I just wanted to mention is um, one of the other things that the Torah wants us to understand about Petzalel's role, in addition to what we just mentioned here, is that when the Torah comes to describe some of the things that Petzalel did, it says, Vayas Bitzalel et Ha'aron, that Bitzalel crafted the Aron Haidut, which of course is the place, the receptacle for the Shnei of the Brit, and it seems said in Taman was put inside there. But what's peculiar about that, Vayas Bitzalel et Ha'aron, is that Bitzalel was the chief architect, and throughout Parsha Vayakel, as the Torah talks about the construction of the Mishkan, it says vayas about the various activities that were accomplished. So vayas means and he made. It's a singular verb, and it refers to Batalel, because in his capacity as chief architect, he oversaw everything. So vayas, 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 vayas. But when it came to the right to the Aron, it yeah. does say vayas, but it also inserts his name Batalel. Vayas Batalel et Aron. So what's different about that? What's different about that is, is that that in indicates that whereas some of the other things he oversaw the construction, he probably was there checking things out, that wasn't the case with the Aron. When it came to the Aron, it had to be him. 
he had to be the one to do it specifically, personally. No oversight, no delegation, but Bitzalel, according to the Meshach of Chokmah, Bitzalel had to be the one based, of course, on this notion that his name specifically mentioned when it comes to the completion of the Aaron. And why is that? One of the reasons, again, has to do with his background. What was his background? Well, he's Hor's son. So what's the connection between Hor and Bitzalel being given the holy task of crafting the Aaron? Well, if you remember, do you remember what was on the Aaron? Well, the Aaron is a gold box, and on top of it is the lid. It's And on the lid, built out of a single piece of gold, are these two figures, angelic figures with faces of children. They look like angels. I guess that's the best look. And so they had wings that were sort of shaped like this, faces facing each other. So when you think about it, and you talk about the holiest icon in the Mishkan, is the Aron Ha'idut, on top of which are these two figures. You could say, whoa, that's a little bit risky. What's the risk? The risk is you're building figures, and we just had the whole debacle of the Egel Azahav, which itself was a figure. Okay, it wasn't an angelic figure, but it's a figure, it's a representation. So why would you then have at the heart the symbol of God's presence two angelic figures, only opening up the door to another bout of idolatrous mistakes that somebody is going to make, just forget about it. But God didn't forget about it. He insisted that this is the way it be done. But if this is the way it had to be done, you got to pick the right person to do it. Who's the right person to do it? Betzalel is the right person to do it. Why Betzalel? Because the message from his grandfather is we fight back against idolatry. This man understands that the fight against idolatry matters. It matters so deeply that we need to have the right conception, we have to have the right ishkop, and we have to have the right mysterious nefesh. And so I'm going to call anybody to build two kuvim, which could possibly be understood. God forbid is an idolatrous image, which is wrong. I need to be done perfectly correctly in order to make it kosher. And the only person I'm going to trust is somebody who gets it in his kishkas because he lived it. Because he sat, you know, he watched this as, as, as his family sat shiva for horror, and he watched as it, as the misconception tore part of the community part, this man is the person who could do it. And again, you know, we, we look at our, our community and we understand that certain people have an understanding of the things that have to be done because they went through things and they understand things and they need to be the voices that we hear and they have to be the people that lead us and they have to be the people that we defer to because they have an understanding that some of us read about, talk about, but may not have had. And Sirut Nefesh to Hashem, his Torah, his faith, and his people sometimes calls upon us to do great things. And for some of those things, there are certain people who have certain qualities. We have many of them, but we may not have all of them. So therefore, Bitzalo, grandson of Hor, who sacrificed his life while opposing the making of the ego, that was the person who was the right person. And because it was the right person, God's presence did, in fact, well amongst the Jewish people, not only because of the Mishkan, but because of it became a unifying factor. And isn't that interesting that even though Hashem said, no, it's got to be this guy, it didn't cause a division in the people. People said, yes, you're right. It has to be him. We support his candidacy or we support his selection as we can. It makes sense to all of us. And God willing, we will once again find ourselves rallying around the right cause, building a mishkan, building the sanctuary of belief in God, service to God, love of the Jewish people, love of his Torah. And if we do that right, if we do it honestly, authentically, with the right motives, then, as I've said from time to time, next time you and I will be learning Parsha Vayakil, we will be standing around in the community, but not in Toronto. We'll be standing around in Yerushalayim, Ira Kodesh, welcoming the Mashiach, welcoming the building of the real Mishkan, and watching the peace that every one of us is longing for, for soldiers to come home, for mothers to hug their children, for wives to be with their husbands, for children to have their parents, and for all of us to live the Simcha, Shalom, and God. So thank you, everybody, for joining. And Nigel, if you want to sort of um, uh, join now and, and ask your question, that would be awesome. Yeah. Amen. Okay. Bye -bye.
I'm, I'm aiming to the uh, to, to that last piece there. Um, <clears throat> just popping back for a second to the um, the missing yud. Yeah. Um, might that also be an indication that the the fact that they decided uh, the, the Nasim felt they didn't really feel that the the rest of the the rest of the people were really up to to doing this so they they would have to to be in maybe it's um maybe it actually reflects um an, an attitude towards what their opinion was of the rest of of uh, soil yeah well, it was not not um what's the word not so complimentary that's right yeah, so yeah. that lack of faith in the Jewish people is um, is um, seen as a somewhat offensive, deficient in trust, deficient in faith in the people. And so the deficiency, as just as you said, is demonstrated through the removal of a unit to demonstrate something's missing in them. Something was yeah. missing in them. And and it's, 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 almost self, it's almost self-centered, going, yes. well, we're much better than they are. I mean, they're, yeah. they're, not, they're not really up to it. We'll, we'll be okay to step in. 100%. It's interesting. Yeah. Sometimes when we see faults in other people, really, it's a way of us identifying the faults that are within us. The Baal Shem Tov said the same thing. When you look at somebody else and you see a problem, what you're really seeing is your problem inside you, but you're seeing it manifest in somebody else. That's interesting. <laughs> well, maybe that's yeah. what the Baal Shem Tov is saying. Mm -hmm. okay, so there is something missing in them. They externalized it. Okay. Thank you, my friends. Okay. I really appreciate your joining us tonight. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Thank you, Marty. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. It means a lot. Hi, Dahlia. Good to see you. Before Shalema. Before Shalema. Before Shalema. Before Shalema. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much. We had here Mr. Tava. Good evening, everybody. We'll see you next week in Ritzeshem, next Tuesday night. Parashat Pekude. On, on Zoom. On Zoom. <laughs> I, th I thought it was actually in Shul tonight because it wasn't shown on the uh, in Shabbat Matters as being uh, a Zoom. Um, so there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why I was late. Try, Everything's try... listed on Zoom. Okay. All right. I guess another way of saying it is you're all, it's a Mazuman here. Okay, so we, <laughs> we do it on Zoom. Yeah, right. I just I, I wanted to make one little comment before before we wrapped up. Yeah, please. Um, I I just was thinking about the fact that um it, you know we'll never again have a, a position where people gave more than than is necessary and they they couldn't stop giving. Um, I just wanted to say that the the money that we have that we have to give part of. We work very hard and we immediately get a salary and, and we sort of feel most of the time like we earned the money. Well, of course, um, some people just inherit money and, and, and giving for them is very, very easy. But, but the Jews weren't accustomed to handling money. They had no place to spend this money. I mean, where were they going to dress up with all these jewels? And, and they weren't going to buy anything. There were no shopping malls around. And and so they were given something to do with this money that they 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 were they were gifted this money by well, if you can call it a gift from the Egyptians, and and they, you know, for hundreds of years they, they didn't ever had any gold or silver or anything like this, and and then all of a sudden you know they're asked to give it. It was just I, what I'm just saying implying is that it might have been easier for them to give the gift than it is for modern people, just to be on the side of modern people. So that, that's an interesting comment. A couple of responses. Number one, according to some of the portions, Ramban included, there was actually a significant amount of trade that took place during the 40 years in the desert. And really? The, yeah, the Jews were involved in trading with tribes that were, were crossing the desert. Um, and so, for example, if we, uh, if, if we remind ourselves of Rashi's comment, that they spend 19 years in the place called Kadesh. So mm. they built up a somewhat of a community. And so it's likely if, according to Rashi, those for 19 years, they weren't entirely self-sufficient and that you need to rely on people who have either services or goods that you don't have. So right. there may have been a place for that. And the second part is, is that, you know, they didn't have 
Now, I don't know, I, I'm not sure I can speak with authority about this, but after having had everything taken from them and then leaving with things, there, another way of looking at it is being gifted, that rather than saying they was gifted, they were taking what rightfully belonged to them, which is one of the one of the positions that the Gemara says, that they wanted their they wanted their things back. You know, they came as a family of wealth, and now it was taken from them. So give it back to us. It belongs to us. Right. We do with it what we want to do. So yeah. I don't disagree that it might have been diff easier. I mean, we live in a complicated, complicated world. And so that's for sure. Um, but I also know this, is that as much as we think we're giving, we're not giving nearly enough to cover the needs of the Jewish community in Toronto, but I think it's true of most communities. So we know that there are very um, philanthropic families and individuals in our community. But the truth is, is that we are still far, far from covering the needs that we that we need. But that's a wonderful point, and I'm grateful for you sharing. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, day, everybody. All the best. Thank you. Okay. And before Shalema to your to your mother-in-law. Thank you so much. Thank you.